Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Ally, Alliance of Independent Authors, Members Q&A, where Michael Laron and I answer the questions that come through for, from our members on any aspect of self-publishing as part of our Ask Ally campaign. Hi, Michael. Good morning or good afternoon. Hello, Orna. <laughs> Hello. Yes, we are global and we always have yes. to be careful because you lovely people may be listening to this in replay and some part yeah. of the world. It could be the middle of the night wherever exactly. you are. Exactly. <laughs> it's hard, hard to remember. So. It's hard to remember, but it's morning where Michael is. He's uh, absolutely dedicated to this show and gets up very early in Midwestern. Uh, is it Midwestern uh, US? Yeah, Midwestern. Here. Midwestern, five o'clock in the morning, just for you guys. It's 5 a.m. No, we have to change this time. We have to talk about changing this time. That is crazy, even for you. <laughs> and he's an early riser, but that's nuts. Okay, we'll talk about this. Um, it's very civilized here in London. It's midday, uh, one o'clock, lunchtime. And so we have uh, lots and lots of member questions for you today. And we have John here and some other members who are joining in the conversation. So if you are a member of the Alliance of Independent Authors and we have time, we will certainly also answer your particular question live here today. But first, we have the questions from the people who submitted them to our Q&A form. So what's up first, Michael? All right. First up, we have a question from Christina, and she asks, I am told no one makes money with a book today. Though my income income is not my goal, I'm not excited about spending another $3,000 for a substantive edit. Is this totally essential for a first-time author, especially since there's no chance of any income from my first book? Right. And this is, of course, um, the, the land of, of myth um, and sweeping statement. So there are lots. You will hear everything about self-publishing from you know, it's easy to make a, min a million on Kindle all the way down to nobody ever makes any money on any book uh, self-publishing. And the truth, of course, as ever with sweeping statements is somewhere in between. It is true that a first book is not likely first out of the gate to make money for you. And even to think about it in that way is kind of to start in the wrong place. So, the question for you really is, do you, you mentioned that, that uh, money is not your main objective. And so what is your objective here? Is it reaching readers? Is it entertainment? Is it inspiration? What is your goal? If you know your goal, it could be much easier to answer that question. Substantive editing is necessary for a first author as a general rule, yes. Um, first time authors need it most and, and need, need most editing and need to invest most in editing at the beginning when they're not getting any return from their books. So um, the short answer to this question is if you are going to go ahead and publish, it would be our advice that you would invest in editing. However, if you are looking to make a return on your book, you need to be thinking in terms of more than one book and that this investment in editing is something that you take into your next book, the book after that, Editing is not just what's done to your book, it's what you learn as an author in the process. I'm sure you've loads to add to this, Michael. Yeah, you know, my, my opinion is a little bit different. You know, I'm um, the, the more the longer I do this, the more I realize that, you know, that's a lot of money to spend on a develop a developmental edit or a substantive edit when you're just starting off. Um, I, I personally, I, I struggle with that just a little bit. Um, I do think that working hand in hand with an editor is absolutely necessary for your first book so that you can learn. Um, it depends on what you're writing, right? If Are you are you writing something that is in the mainstream or are you writing something that's more literary? Um, if you're, it, it depends on what your goals are, right? Because if you're gonna spend that kind of money, you might be better served investing um, in a copy editor instead, and then spending more money on your real estate, like your website or uh, other things that are going to help you make connections with readers. Um, because again, you know, first books, it, it, it can be tough to, to make that money, right? And so um, anything you can do to minimize that cost for your first book so that you can write more books um, that will generate you return, that might be a better option. So um, I, I have a little bit of an alternative contrarian view here, but um, well, it's, it's important to just recognize that. 
I agree. I agree completely with with what you're saying in the sense that, you know, we need to know the goal here. So mm-hmm. the, the question has clearly said the goal is not to make money. So what is the goal? So we're completely aligned around that. Secondly, I would ask why why 3000 for a substantive edit? There are many ways that you could approach the need to develop your manuscript that might not be as costly as that. So that, for example, if you get um, some good beta readers who could help you with some of the substantive and developmental work, then you could perhaps cut down on that bill. I'm presuming that you got a quotation for that amount of money. And again, that it wasn't just something that somebody said, that's what it was going to cost. Because editors come in all shapes and sizes and they charge very differently for different services because some of them find developmental editing uh, very challenging and time consuming and some of them find it um, a lot easier and quicker. So the the first thing is know your goal. And the second thing is shop around and think about how you can get the help you need. But editing um, is essential for a first time author, however you come about it. Also think about the self-editing process and look at some of the books and courses that are available at that level also. All right. Great answer. And so we have another great question from Nick and he asks, I'm looking for pointers on a good sample of a license or contract between me as an author and me as my business or my imprint or my publisher. Um, It seems like things might be uh, like a standard publishing contract, um, but I I just, I'm not quite sure how this would, would look. Is there any resources you can point me toward? So he's looking for a sample contract to basically sell his copy or or license his copyright from him to his business, to his his LLC. I understand. Or from from his LLC to him as an author. Um, Correct. Yeah. Um, Well, you can use the sample trade publishing contract, which you'll find in the Ally uh, member zone under legal and contracts. Um, That is based on the best of... um, Mm -hmm typical trade publishing contracts. Having said that, the typical trade publishing contract is not all that author friendly. So as you are an author and you are actually uh, going to be making this agreement with yourself, you might, when you're wearing your publisher hat, um, change some of those clauses. And there is an actual explanation of what what each of the clauses means and, and so on. So you can get a bit of clarity around that. And then if you have a further question, which I think you probably might have, maybe bring it along next month. Yeah, I, what I would say is just a couple things here. Um, I would take the trade publishing agreement that we have, and then I would look through it, look at, you know, because we've vetted it, you know, it's author friendly. And then I, w- I would take that and, and basically strip it out and customize it to, to your needs. And another thing that you could do is you could check out Helen Sedwick's self-publishing legal handbook would be a great resource for you to just un- to help you wrap your head around some of the legal concepts that you need to know um, when you're working with contracts. And also um, Christine Catherine Rush's How to Close the Deal on Your Own Terms. I think it was formerly known as Deal Breakers. Uh, it's a fantastic book that basically goes over all of the really important uh, publishing clauses that you need to know about. Understand those. Most of those you probably won't need in your own contract, but just basically helping you figure out, okay, what actually needs to be here? Right, and then just tailor it between you and yourself, um, and and that's that's usually good enough. And and depending on what country you live in, you know, when you go to attorneys, a, a, an attorney ha- usually has a template, and it's like eighty nine pages, <laughs> you know, and they just pull it to you and they give it to you, and it, it basically is everything that could possibly happen. If you wanted to do that, you probably could um, for a minimal fee uh, contract with a with an attorney who could help you with that as well. If you were really just wanting to make sure that everything was watertight. So. If you do want to take that route, make sure you use somebody who actually has experience in publishing Correct. contracts. They're a particular breed and an awful yes, lot of, of legal people don't don't have that experience. But I agree with Michael that it's not actually necessary. Take a look also at how authors sell publishing rights on our website. Uh, or sorry, yeah, it's uh, book three in our successful self-publishing series and you can download it in the member zone as part of your membership as well. And it will help you to some degree. And in fact, um, your question prompts me to think that we should actually include something around this in both our book and on our blog. So if you'd like to get in touch about that as well, 
then uh, let's let's deepen this kind of conversation and find out is it necessary and does it you know are, are there a lot of authors who would like to do this as reassurance or you know why you might or might not all right so our next question is from someone who asks questions of the show quite regularly as, as a, a podcast regular and that's isabel del rio and she asks hello i am planning to publish as an i'm, I'm planning to publish an american author and i would like to know more about foreign rights including the possibility of some short stories uh, in a book being sold individually i'm based in the uk where should i start um again start with how authors sell publishing rights so UK and US, um, it's not really considered foreign rights. Foreign rights generally refers to translation. So English language rights are increasingly being sold um, on a world rights basis. So the fact that the author is American isn't really terribly relevant, um, particularly if they are prepared to give you as publisher their um, North American rights for the ebook. So it simplifies matters greatly if you can get world rights for the ebook because we can't electronically split up the world. When it comes to the print book, that's a slightly different thing. But again, with print on demand, depending on how you intend to distribute the book as publisher, um, perhaps world rights might be the most efficient um, objective, or sorry, efficient way of doing it there, um, Isabel. So, Again, it depends, as ever, on exactly what your goals are and exactly what your author would like. I know you're a very author-friendly uh, company so and that you want to do whatever they want. So there will be some negotiation around that. But um, traditionally, in, in, in the traditional publishing model, subsidiary rights uh, cover foreign rights which generally means translation and english language rights covers all of the english speaking world so hopefully that's a useful distinction yep and um if if you're interested another a, a great book to check out if because you, you asked about short stories as well isabel is um, playing the short game by douglas smith and it's a fantastic book that basically goes into the marketing side of selling short stories and so it's very author friendly um, but I think that you get some benefit from it, just reading it as a publisher to see, okay, how, how can I start marketing the short stories of of the author that I'm publishing? And um, what are some of the terms if I ever wanted to create an anthology for myself of short stories, how would I set that up? Um, it's a fantastic book that would give you some great, um, some great guidance in this space as well. Fantastic. All right, our next question is from Tamsin Rush. And the question is, a client would like to publish a book of poetry, which he, found handwritten in an unpublished journal sometime around 1890. He has tried to, and failed to find the original author as it was written under a pen name. Can the company claim copyright of the published book? The copyright remains um, with the author for 70 years uh, from their death. So likelihood is that this book is now in the open domain. Um, so in terms of copyright, you have you have no great problem there or no rights that are owed to the author. However, you can always assign the copyright to the author while trading in those rights as the publisher, if that makes sense, if you want to just give the author credit where it's due. Yeah, I, you could definitely give credit to be on the safe side. Um, I, if it's published, it, most countries have, have adhered to the same standards from a copyright perspective, with I think it was the Bernie Convention. And if it's published before 1922, you really don't have an issue. Now, is it possible, I suppose, that you know, if this person, you know, assign the copyright to another company or to a, you know, to, to 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 family members, you know, after the author passed, is that a possibility? Yes. So just, you know, do your due diligence and just try to search everywhere you can, <laughs> depending on the country you live in. You know, the United States, you might be able to do some sort of a copyright search. Um, but yeah, you're probably going to be OK. And I, I would I would err on the side of caution and just make sure you attribute everything. Great. Um, I would like to just pop back. Um, we have a comment here on the first question about the editor. And Regina Richards has hopped in with a very interesting comment that I'd just like to, to kind of raise now if our questioner is still around. Um, my recommendation is don't hire an editor on your first novel until you've finished writing your fifth novel. Then hire that editor only after rereading your first and deciding if you actually do want to put that novel out into the world or if it's better off left in a box under your bed. 
If it's worth sending out, edit it yourself with your new enhanced skills that you've gained from writing the other four books, then do the beta reader thing, then maybe pay for an edit because there's a value at that point. Okay, it's it's a view and I'm just kind of passing it on. <laughs> Thoughts yep. on that, Michael? Um, yeah, it's a view. <laughs> I, have to, I have to push back and disagree with that a little bit. Um, it, it, it's be very careful about putting a book out without editing, right? Because with that first 30, 60, 90 days is critical. And people that read that are going to automatically see it and they're going to form opinions about you. And you're never going to be able to reverse that. Um, so wherever possible, if you can afford it, always make sure you publish a quality product. Otherwise, it, it could come back to haunt you and, and you could regret it. You know, it's kind, of, it's kind of like getting a bad tattoo. You know, you can't, you can't undo it, right? Without, without a significant amount of effort and time and money and so just just keep that in mind, you know, thinking long term, right? We're indie authors and the, and the point here is to really make sure we're thinking long term. Just don't make make sure you don't make any decisions that that you're going to potentially regret or have to spend more money um, fixing down the road. I, th I think what Regina was, I don't think she was saying don't. She did say maybe pay for an editor in the end, but I think her main point was your uh, your first novel is not ready for the world. And, you know, no matter what you do with it, that you should go on, write four more books and then go back to the start, which I think is a big ask for most most authors. And it is an interesting view. It's certainly what people had to do in the trade publishing world when you had to wait until somebody accepted you. Um, I'm speaking yeah. from personal experience. Every time I got the book back with a no, the manuscript, I should say, whenever it came back with a no, I would go back in and do another edit before sending it out again. And I def definitely, by the time it was picked up, it was a far different beast and a better, better manuscript than it was when I started. So however there is great value i think also in the publishing process and the putting it out there readers coming back you know seeing your reviews all those kinds of things um also help to develop so there is no right way as we're nope. clearly seeing and that's why offering regina's uh, thought for for your um consideration as well absolutely and you know do whatever works best for you and i love the comments and i love all the rights questions today too. Yeah, you know, we've a lot all today. All the copyrights questions and editing questions. It's fantastic. So I, I uh, think with the rights, it's interesting to me, just as you've raised that, I think it's a sign of maturity in the indie author space. I mean, two years ago, our questions were all about production, making a book. Now we get far more questions about, uh, you know, editorial, developing the books, becoming a better writer and rights questions as well. So I, I think it's a really positive sign. Um, Yes. All right. So we have a member question now, a membership related question. And this is from Claudette. She asks, I would like to attend the Frankfurt Book Fair for the first time. And I was instructed to align myself with a national organization, um, ACS, CBE, IBPA, to ensure that I can navigate the fair being a newcomer. Is Ally considered a national association such as these? And if so, what are your terms to partner with at a book fair like this? And who would if not, who would you recommend? She's inter interested in selling her some book rights at the at the fair. Sure. Well, Ally is a bit different and a bit. Uh, we part ways a little bit with our Nash some of um, our national association colleagues on on this on how book fairs are best handled. So, a number of the associations that you have named will offer authors um, a package whereby they'll bring their book to the fair, display the book at the fair and have conversations on your behalf. However, they generally bring lots and lots of books, as many, you know, uh, sometimes hundreds, um, but even if it's fewer. Um, and the books go onto a booth um, at the fair. And to be frank, unless the organization is actively doing something with a rights expert about selling the rights in your particular book, the it's highly unlikely that your book is going to get exposure from that. So we don't do it. We don't think it has a lot of value, to be frank. Um, in terms of attending a book fair, we have a section in our book, How Authors Sell Publishing Rights, about that. But we have also teamed up with um, PubMatch which is the organ, um, a right, an online rights marketplace, which has been uh, in existence for a while. We had a membership, uh, sorry, a partnership with them a while ago, um, a few years ago. 
and it kind of faded away because they weren't really quite ready. Things have improved there now and we're offering it as a way where our members can actually get together a rights catalogue and some of the other things that you will need if you're serious about selling your rights that I can't go into on this show because it would take too long, but all the information is in that book, How Authors Sell Publishing Rights. So in terms of going to a book fair and selling your rights, the right sales don't happen down on the, on the show floor where people buy, you know, where associations and publishers buy a booth for networking and connection. They happen upstairs or in uh, behind closed doors in, in the rights center. That's where rights are bought and sold. And they're bought and sold by rights professionals, many of whom work for trade publishing houses, but also people who increasingly work freelance on behalf of authors and somebody and, and other people. So really what you need is either to become as good as those rights professionals, understanding the sale of rights and how rights are sold and bought in the digital age, or you need somebody who has that level of expertise. Just turning up at the book fair, even turning up as part of an association, while there are lots of, uh, you know, there's lots of value in the networking, but you say your aim is to sell rights, and it's not very likely to achieve that goal for you. All right, I think you said it better than I could. So next question is from Kevin, and he asks another membership question, and that is, can you display the Ally membership badge in your books? We have no um, objection if you would like to do that. I will say we're just about to relaunch our website with lovely new badges, which will look even better in your book. So if you want to wait a week or two um, <laughs> before you, you put it in, but we've absolutely no objection to you doing that. We will be delighted and thank you. Yeah, show that ally pride and, and absolutely show it on your website as well. I have um, my ally badge on all my websites. Um, so that's another great place to put it too. So, all right, so we have another question here. And this question is from uh, Peter and he asked, this is a, this is a pretty important question. Um, should authors writing historical pieces get liability insurance to protect them in their work or does the publisher provide that in the, the publishing contract? With the nature of our book, we're considering an LLC for our writings present and future and we have been advised to get liability insurance instead. Are we on the right path? Well, you're on two, there are two different paths, if you know what I mean. Um, so they're not mutually exclusive either. So let's just take the public liability thing first, the liability insurance for, sorry, not public liability, but uh, I presume what we're talking about here is libel, defamation, uh, that end of the law. A publishing contract will specifically um, push that back to an author. So there will be a clause in almost every trade publishing contract uh, around liability and you and the publisher will be held responsible if there is a libel issue and, it, and somebody decides to take you to court. So your first responsibility around um, this is not the legal end of it, but it is to ensure that you do not uh, libel or defame anybody, because I'm sure you wouldn't want to do that. And there are lots of different ways that you can get around that. Now, obviously, clearly, um, often in the public interest, it is necessary to say things that then can then be challenged under libel and defamation law. And I live in the UK where this law has been misused uh, very widely to stifle um, press freedom and, and publisher freedom. So I know what you're talking about. And there are times when we have to kind of cross that line, but there are lots of times when we don't. And so I would like to kind of flag that up first. Sometimes we have authors who are saying things and they want to cover themselves with insurance when really what they need to do is go back in and say it better, mm -hmm. say it differently. There are various ways to protect yourself against libel in terms of how you express the things you're saying. Um, again, which there's too much to go into in detail there, but there is a section again on uh, libel. Helen Sedwick has an excellent section on libel in her legal handbook. And there's lots of good information um, from um, on the internet and we can point towards some of those sources. 
The other question of becoming an LLC is, to my mind, a different question. They don't, one doesn't protect against the other. You either decide you want to become an LLC and not to trade as a sole trader. And if you're going to be doing uh, highly contentious and controversial books, you know, as a principle going forward, then certainly it would be recommended that you don't remain a sole trader because um, you won't have the protection that you are afforded by becoming a company. So I'm sure you've lots to add on this, Michael. Yeah, yeah, this is the, the, the I, I, I love the question of authors asking about insurance because it's something that we have not been talking about in the industry. So I think you did, did a great job separating out the issues, right? There's a big difference between an LLC um, and, and getting insurance. The LLC, you're going to set that up to protect you from a, a legal perspective and to protect you, to give you some tax benefits, right? At least here in the United States. Um, but, but this piece of insurance, you know, there really is not, to my knowledge right now, an insurance product that really does justice for authors. Your standard general liability policy does not cover um, slander, does not cover defamation. Um, that's typically excluded, right? And there are what you can buy called media errors and omissions policies or media liability policies that provide some coverage. Basically, they're intended for publishers, right? The problem there is that they're expensive. <laughs> so you can get a quote. I mean, there are, I think, trade organizations that, that have deals with uh, certain insurance companies that have this product, um, but they're very expensive. Um, and so I think the question you have to ask yourself is, as Orna said, are there other ways for you to mitigate your potential liability from a libel and slander perspective? Um, or does this make sense? You know, and, and, and typically for the authors that are writing these types of things um, who want insurance, they're so risky that insurance companies won't won't sell it. So if you're writing a biography or a memoir um, or a true crime, insurance companies are going to say, no, I don't want to want to write that because those are typically the types of books that lead to libel and slander. So the authors that actually need it the most, <laughs> there's really no policy or, 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 or insurance coverage for them. So if, if, if you do decide on your path that insurance is the right way to go, because we can't tell you not to get insurance, right? It, but if you decide that that is the right way to go, just you want to definitely engage a, a licensed independent agent that maybe has access to a lot of different carriers and maybe knows the market um, and that can maybe help you provide something or, or help come up with something that would be a good solution for you. Uh, excellently said. The Just one final thing that I would add is that um, the policies that Michael is talking about uh, are US and I think our questioner is US because he used the LLC um, term and that's generally a giveaway but I'm not sure where you're located, perhaps you're not um, in US and certainly there is no global policy for authors no. and because we're talking about an ebook of course this ebook will be read in jurisdictions outside of your own and so your your insurance in your jurisdiction um you know how how usable is that even yeah. where does defamation begin and end in this digital age these are questions to which there are no answers yet we just haven't caught up the law has not caught up with what's going on in the publishing space and there's a lot of you know, dancing around the heads of pins over here while the whole world of publishing is changing over here. Yeah. And and authors are, you know, not going, they're not being provided with the sort of protections that many of them feel they want. However, I do think it's important that we, um, we recognize that our safety is in many ways in our hands and that we take um, as much responsibility as we can for that. Agreed. All right. So we have a, another question here. And this actually, so we've got through the majority of our questions. Um, this question is from Nathalie. And she asks, how do I, how do I deal with Amazon keeping old editions of my paperback for sale on their site? Is there a way to completely remove one of my titles that's out of print? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, I would like to do that with some of mine, but they're there for the duration. Um, Amazon sees itself as providing a sort of a library as well as um, its, its other functions as a retailer. So no, they don't allow that. All right. And so the second part of her question, um, she asked two questions, but um, the second question is, can I have Amazon move reviews from the first paperback edition of my book to the second paperback edition of my book? 
you can try. Um, we know members who have successfully done that and we know members who have asked for that and who have not succeeded in, in it happening. But certainly if you ever want Amazon to do anything, the first thing to do is ask their support desk. People, authors often are a bit scared of Amazon because of its, well, because of its huge power um, and, and other reasons. But actually support desk can be helpful in lots of, lots of ways. So always begin there, just asking for the help that you want. And you may be pleasantly surprised that they will do what you ask. And if they can't do it or, or won't do it, they will say so. They may not always explain why or explain why in a way that you can understand, but they always, that's your first port of call. And, and as I said, you can be pleasantly surprised. And certainly with this, it's definitely worth asking. Yeah, definitely. And we have two comments that we should call out here. So uh, Dale Roberts to the question of, um, you know, should, can you remove out of print? I believe he says, I wish there was a way. My good friend, Dale Roberts. Um, thank you, Dale, for your comment. And then uh, John Betts, back to the editing question. So a lot of great comments on the editing here. Uh, John Betts says, I use the free Grammarly um, for a first edit while writing before beta readers. And only after that do I use an editor. So that's right. a great, great comment. Yes, it's definitely worth having the uh, free softwares to help you. And that's at the proofreading kind of line editing level. Obviously, Grammarly won't help you at the structural substantive level, but I think we should all have one of those free softwares. Another very good one is the um, Pro Writing Aid, yep. uh, which actually Grammarly is designed for students and um, Pro Writing Aid is designed for authors. It's it's really, mm -hmm. it's, I've, I shifted. I always love Grammarly, but I've actually moved over. And yes, hello, Dale. Lovely to see you here. Yes. All right, so well, now we're out of time, I think. So we are. <laughs> Hello and goodbye. <laughs> yes, but we got through all of our questions this month. Um, so thank you guys for for sending in your questions and, and definitely keep them coming. There was a question offline about how to submit questions to, to hear us on the show. So if you're an Ally member, you know, remember that you can go into your dashboard, log into your dashboard, and, and there's a link to a submission form where you can ask your question. And those take first priority. So we want to make sure we answer all the member questions that are submitted. So we've cleared the decks on those. Um, and then if you are happen to be watching us live, it, be sure to put your question in the comments. And if we've got time left over, kind of like we did now, uh, we can get to those and make, make sure we answer your questions as well. Absolutely. And finally, just to say that some of the questions we receive are not covered on the show. It might be because we covered it last time or somebody else has also asked a question that's similar or for lots of different reasons, but they are all answered. So they will all be um, answered privately, if not um, out loud here on the show. So that's it from us, I think, for this month. And uh, what are you up to this month, Michael, between now and next time we meet? I am uh, moving houses. So my wife and I bought a new house and I'm in the process of getting moved and I'm going to have a new YouTube studio. It's actually going to be a studio. So I'm, I'm super excited to kind of get my hands dirty and start building that. Fantastic. So you'll be writing more books uh, live for our, our delectation? I will try. I will try. It, that, it took a lot of it took a lot of effort to do that, but it was a I great project. I bet. I bet. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. Great. How about happy you? Happy writing, yep. everybody, and happy publishing and happy creating. See you next month. Take care, everybody. Bye now.